Welcome to the Social Mission Revolution. Each week we explore some of the greatest undertold stories of businesses and everyday people who are making their ultimate impact in the world through social mission. This is Social Mission Revolution and this is your host, Andrea Putting. Welcome to Social Mission Revolution. And today my guest is Frances Carlton, who has a social mission called Wild Talk. And I'm very interested to talk to her about this because we've been going through in Australia a, a time of massive trauma with a lot of bushfires that have just devastated the country and our wildlife. And Francis' social mission is very much related to, to helping people who need, who offer that kind of support that's required at this time. So Francis, I'd love you to welcome a thought, first of all. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. And I'd like you to just share with us a little bit about who you are and what it is. Just a snippet of what you do to, to start us in the introduction. Yeah, of course. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Frances Carlton. I'm a therapist based in Canberra. I, um, I started, my, um, started my work really, really wanting to be a sex therapist um, because that was an area of interest of mine. And um, it's, that's how I did my, you know, did my training um, when I did my master's degree in counselling and applied psychotherapy. And I did my placement um, with Impetus Australia and I love, and I absolutely love that work. And it was really interesting because everyone always said to me, oh, you know, you'll just, you'll just find your space. You'll, you know, you'll ease into what it is that you're meant to do. If you're meant to do mm -hmm. group work, you'll do group work. And about two, two or three years after I had graduated, I started volunteering with a wildlife organisation to look after animals. And I sort of sat back for the first 12 months and attended every course you could possibly go to, how to look after wombats, how to look after roos, how to look after snakes mm. and lizards. And what I realised was that my place wasn't necessarily looking after the animals. It was actually looking after the people. So I realised that they did not have that support. They're volunteers. They are, you know, they would rather put um, their last dollar into buying food for the animals than for themselves. And I just sort of said, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to care for the carers because um, they need it. And I did, I did do snakes and lizards and turtles and things like that for a few years. And then this year um, I decided that Wild Talk was, it needed to be happening and it was going to happen in August, 2020. And I was going to launch it at the conference and do all that sort of stuff. And then the bushfires happened and I did about eight months worth of work in eight days to get Wild Talk yeah. up and running and going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that, that's a little bit about how I got here. Yeah, but I've been doing it for five. I've been counselling wildlife carers for free for five years today. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's a very much needed, needed service. Before we go any further, I just want to ask yeah, you my, my one question that I ask everybody that I have on yeah, Social Mission Revolution of yeah. if there was just one thing for you to fight for, what would that be? A better understanding that mental health is a is as valid as a physical injury. Um, you know, you go to the doctor, you've got a broken leg, you go to the doctor, you don't walk around on it. But why is it so difficult and why is it so unacceptable for people that are experiencing issues with their thoughts to go and seek somebody um, to help them just work through those thoughts? Yeah, and help them yeah. heal. Yeah, mm. and that's a really important issue. And mm. it's, it's a massive issue. I was start to look at the other day and because I was looking at loneliness and how many, many people that how that impacts society of depression and so mm. many people don't feel they've got people around them to support them, mm. to help them just in their everyday life. So mm. it's a mm. massive, Absolutely. massive problem in Australia. I did look at the figures of... I think it's one million Australian adults suffer. I think it was two million every year 
there's two million people. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's something yeah, like so that, which is a depression massive. and anxiety. Yeah, depression and anxiety are huge. So somewhere in the region yeah. of two million Australians every year are diagnosed with depression. Yeah. Um, somewhere in the region of about three million Australians every year are diagnosed with uh, anxiety. So, you know, and we're not even we're not even going into sort of like the causes of those that those things no. things like um, social pressures, social social isol- isolation is 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 massive, and isolation is one of the things that I see with wildlife carers because they don't feel like they can talk to people about why they are stressed and why they're upset and why they've got these issues mm-hmm. with you know they're doing this work that's incredibly fulfilling to them but then they get confused and about why they you know you know I shouldn't feel I shouldn't feel this way about because this animal was never mine it's always a wild animal so most most or what most wildlife organizations have a credo of we rescue we rehabilitate and we release amazing that's absolutely the goal yeah. however there's nothing in there about our carers are going to get attached along the way. Absolutely. So, our, our, you know, the carers, and, and, and I can say for myself that um, I was looking after lizards and snakes. I mean, these are not the cuddliest things, right? No. So you, <laughs> you'd, get a, you'd get a cuddle, you'd get a, you, you know, you get a lizard in that's been attacked by a dog. It might be in a tank for, you know, you might have it for, you know, a month or so. You're feeding it every day and you're cleaning it out. That's it. You're not, you're not, you're not holding this little thing and feeding it like a baby every two to four hours, like you would with a possum or a, you know, a joey or a wombat. Well, yeah. And wombats have got a rehabilitation. If you get a pinky wombat, it's a two year commitment. Wow. It's a two year commitment. So when, when these, and you can't tell me that in that time, nope, not getting attached, not getting attached. It doesn't work. It doesn't work no. like that. No. So there's also there's also things that are unique to the wildlife um, population that we have to think about. You know, like the thing about kangaroos is that if you rescue a kangaroo um, and it's a it's a velvet, so it's just getting its fur. What can happen is that they get they they get this thing called myopathy, which is uh, an an acidic buildup in their muscles that can take up to eight months to kill them. So you wow. can be nursing. Gosh. You can be nursing a joey, a joey kangaroo for months, and then it will just go, oh. and it will just go downhill really, really quickly. And sometimes you, sometimes you can bring them back. Sometimes you can't. You, you but it's literally like a forty-eight hour. You've got a forty-eight hour window in there. So there's there's things that are very unique to the wildlife um, to the wildlife sphere that you have to take into consideration. It's not just grief it's you know it's almost parental grief that we're talking about yeah here. that's what i was and, thinking and it's huge saying it's that. huge yeah, yeah it's huge so you know um you know you've got a you've got a you've got a joey you've got a wombat you've you've raised it from a little pinky and you you know you've put it through all its stages and you've done a soft release and you've released it into your yard and you've got it and then you've got to and then you've got to sort of worry about well you know the next thing is well what's going to happen to that joey yes it might find a mob it might have been released with a mob it's got to have to go out into its world. It's going to leave my property that I bought specially so that I could release wildlife. <laughs> it's going to, it's going to leave my safe sanctuary of a wildlife and my neighbors might not like kangaroos and yeah. they might have a license to shoot. So, or they might go a little bit further afield and come across the highway and mm-hmm. not be aware of cars. So there's this, there's this sort of long, long, long term of the worry of what happens next. Yeah. I, I got attached to a brown snake for crying out loud. So, and that was, that was, I know. And that was, and that was, um, you know, that was, it's far less cuddly than any yeah. of the, of the, and koalas and things like that. Just, just, yeah. And I, yeah, I'm, but I'm a sucker. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a snucker for a, a sucker for a snake. What can I say? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And Kevin, Ke- Ke- Kevin will always be in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, the brown snake will always be in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough gig, I think, of, of caring for wildlife because of that constant, need and requirements of a baby animal we would yes. my husband and I were talking about the other day and saying how it's something that we both would have loved to be able to do but we just don't have 
it just so encompasses your life. Mm. And I can imagine as being a mother, I'm thinking about sometimes you find you can easily become isolated from, from the world because your, your whole life is wrapped around this infant. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now imagine you've got 20 of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like my life just I just had this flashback of me as a yeah, ten, yeah. as a as a ten year old i I had to care for a baby cockatoo oh. <laughs> now back in, yeah back in the seventies you didn't you didn't release them you just yeah it was just this baby cockatoo came to live with us and he is outside live still lives with me <laughs> right oh wow, that was a commitment so <laughs> Well, he was my father's cockatoo, but I, as a 10 year old, yeah. I was his primary carer. So I, I kind of yeah. remember that constant having to feed and care for this baby. So yeah, yes. like said, imagine 20 of them and that's your whole life. It's, yeah. it's a yeah. big thing. Yeah. Well, with kangaroos and wombats and things like that, um, wombats actually feel pain when they're hungry. So wow. they, 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 will, they will scream. They, they will scream. If they're hungry, they will scream. So mm. you absolutely have to get up and you have to have that, that, that regime of, you know, depending on how old they are, every two hours, every four hours, every five hours. So it's, um, it, it, it's a huge commitment. So it's very, it's, you know, and it is very childlike. Um, but, you know, but that's, I mean, that's just, that's just one of the things that wildlife carers do. They also have to deal with, you know, they have to go out and deal with members of the public who are distressed because they, have come across an injured an injured animal they have to uh, mm. they have to go and help you know um and it's happening quite a lot at the moment down in um in down in south australia and up in far north queensland where the temperatures are getting so hot that they're having uh, mass death as mass, mass death events with the flying foxes where it just gets too hot and they just yeah, can't they, they just, just can't drop survive. It. well the thing is they don't just drop out of, some of them do but not not all of them do because Flying foxes don't have, they don't have, they don't require energy to, to hold on to the tree. Their, their, their toes actually lock in this position. So what can happen when a flying fox dies in the tree? It just stays there. It just stays hanging in the tree and it's oh my gosh. deceased. And the worst thing is that what can happen is if the, 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 the pups, um, actually the, the nipple, the, the nipple on a, on a flying fox is under the armpit. So if you can imagine our, our arm is attached to our hip with a flap of skin, that's, mm -hmm. the fly, that's a flying fox's wing. So the wing is actually made up of the fingers of our fingers. If you look at the, the structure, the, yeah. uh, the structure of our arm and the structure of a flying fox's wing is almost identical. The bones are just in different dimensions. But their, their nipple is under there and then they wrap their, they wrap their arm around their baby. So what can happen is a mother fox can flying fox can die with the baby uh, suckling, and the baby's still alive, but crying for its mother. Oh gosh! And they're hanging in the tree. So you've got a carer who's gone out to try and to try and help uh, to try and help these you know these animals, but they can't get to the babies because they're so high in the tree. But they can hear them crying. So yes, exactly. Exactly. So these are the sorts of things that um, at the moment that I've been dealing with a lot of, um, you know, over the, over the last five years, I've averaged probably, I don't know, maybe I started with two or three and then I went up to four or five and then, um, and I've done a few, I spoke at a conference back in 2018 and I got a little bit of an uplift in calls then and I was, but I was still only averaging about six calls a month. Since Boxing Day, and now we're now recording in the middle of January, since Boxing Day, I've had over 70 calls. So the, the uplift um, related to bushfires, to starvation, to um, these, the, these, these mass events with the flying foxes, the, the, just, just the um, people, people wanting to go out into the fire, fire grounds after the fires have been put out but they can't get in there yet because it's not safe because they're still worried about reignition. When they do get out there, they're, they're talking about the silence, how silent it is. There's no, there's no insect sounds. There's no rustle of the undergrowth. There's no sounds in the trees. So, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, 
going from really vibrant bush settings that these people are used to releasing their animals in. And they're, they're familiar with the territory, so they know what it's supposed to sound like. But now it's just silent. That must be so devastating, mm. so heart-wrenching for mm. them. Mm. But, yeah. but for someone who hasn't, who isn't normally in the bush or whatever, or familiar with it, you would go in there and wouldn't even think about it. But they yeah. must just feel death yes. staring them at the face. And the sense of helplessness mm. and hopelessness at the moment with a lot of the carers that I'm talking to is, is completely overwhelming. It's just, um, it's just all encompassing. And, you know, the, the, you know, the suggestions that I'm making for them to help, to help them sort of get back into their own center rather than being sort of so outwardly focused is about, they need to focus on themselves. They need to, they need to turn social media off. They need to stop watching the news. Um, they need to stop being immersed in in this because that in itself is actually quite traumatizing even if you're not a wildlife carer you know watching yeah. the devastation and watching the animals and hear you know hearing the injured animals making sounds that they don't normally make um you know that that in itself is is very very difficult to take so when you're an animal carer and by their very existence they care um about these animals they need to get back into themselves and really focus on a little bit of self-care for, for a little while and that's you know you know having a ha having a shower and eating some good food um giving themselves space and time from social media uh, and from being involved in it and just doing what they can and really bringing that that view sort of like from wide back into right here right now for me and the animals yeah. that I already have, um, and you know that can be that can be really really difficult uh, for a lot of people because they have been so outwardly focused for so long that suddenly bringing it back into well what do I need right now um, is mm -hmm. it's actually re is is really hard and that and that's where I work with that's where I work with clients it's about bringing that perspective um, back to what we need right here right now. Yeah, and it, the world. it yeah. can be hard for anyone in any any caring role to oh yeah <laughs> to come back into yourself and go well hang yeah. on I have to think about myself right now <laughs> yeah, absolutely and, and, and while you're thinking that everything else is going off and you're going well this person need, this this needs attention and this one needs attention and you just lost yeah. in in that and you lose yourself in that so. yeah in my in my private practice so um wild talk which is this organization that i've now set up it's in the, it's in actually currently in the process of being made into a charity yeah. company a charity and hopefully that will be all set up and up and running for um donations and sponsorships and that sort of stuff by the end of january um, because as, as I said, I've had to do this all very yeah. much quicker than than had originally been planned. Yes, and that, so that was that 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 that's all in the works. In my private practice, so um, in my private practice, which has been running for the last uh, six or seven years, um, I ev on my Facebook page for that, um, I I do a self care Saturday, self care Sunday. So I do a I do a live video where I talk to I talk to camera and I sort of say, well, you know, this is what I'm doing for self-care today um last night i went to open air cinema uh, i drove all the way up to sydney from canberra which is about a three hour drive a three and a bit hour drive and i it was raining which was amazing um, I, never thought, <laughs> Yay, rain. I never thought i never thought i never thought i'd be sat in an open air cinema going oh my god it's amazing it's raining <laughs> so, my friend and i were sat there going oh my god isn't this rain amazing so <laughs> You know, so even 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 that is to be able to to be, to be able to acknowledge that, you know, this is what we need. This is what we needed right now. We needed to sit here and have a glass of wine and watch a film that we've seen before, you know, with this amazing view and just sort of switch off. You know, just just switch off and just spend a couple of hours, you know, doing nothing, doing something yeah. that you enjoy, doing something and Absolutely. and. You know, and I, I, I realise, so I'm, 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 a, I'm a massive um, uh, film file, so I love going to the movies and I love going to movies that don't tax my brain because <laughs> of the job that I do. Yeah. So 
I, I generally go to the movies every weekend. So I have this little, little ritual. I, I would generally go and have lunch and take the dog. I've got a little chihuahua. I take the dog and then I go to the movies. I go to a flea pit cinema so they don't even care if I've got the dog in a bag. Um, I, take, I, t- I do that and then I do my self-care video and I really, really enjoy it. And I realised last night, so what are we now? The 19th of, 19th of January. I realised last night I haven't been to the cinema for a month mm-hmm. because I've been too busy <laughs> dealing with wildlife carers, which yeah. I'm not resentful of or anything like that. But I realized that I had put that, that particular activity, which is really important to me on hold. Mm-hmm. And I, and I realized for myself, you know, cause you know, I'm, I'm essentially a, a carer, a carer for people. Um, I realized just how important that two or three hours a week is for me yeah and you know i've had i've had people tell me that the amount of self-care that i do is selfish (laughs) okay and this is the thing that we come up against a lot um in in counseling is that people don't feel that they can engage in self-care because it's selfish yeah. And the reality is that if you don't engage in self-care, you can't give to other people. It's that old yeah. thing of There's, you've got to put the mask, the, when yes. you're on a plane, you've got to put the yes. oxygen mask on yourself before you can, can put it on someone else. Yeah. You have because to if, you don't put it, if you don't put it on yourself first, what happens? You die you and put, they die as well. Well, you at, at, at the ver- at the very least you pass out and you become a trip hazard. Yeah, because you because you collapse into the aisle on the aeroplane and then people have to climb over you. So you you need to <laughs> you need you need you absolutely need to put that oxygen mask on first and look after yourself before you can um, before you can help somebody else. The other the other analogy is the empty cup. You can't pour yeah. from an empty cup. No. So self care is not selfish and. Self-care is more than just going to the movies and or going and getting your hair cut or getting a manicure done. You know, self-care is getting up and having a shower, eating nice food. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you have if you really, really want to, if you really want to go and buy yourself that new pair of my cat's decided to start crying. If you <laughs> well, really, really want to Yeah. At least if you want to go and buy that, 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 that lovely pair of, pair of shoes because it's going to really make you feel good and you can afford to do it, do it. Mm. You know, self-care comes in so many different forms. Um, on Thursday night, I had a really big day. I came home. I put, I, put on, I, put, I put on a record, an actual record. And I just sat on the couch and listened to music for half an hour. Wonderful. And at the end of it, I just got up and went, okay, I can go to bed now. Because I know that if I'd gone to bed, I would have just been thinking about the day yeah. on, a, on, a, on, a, on a reoccurring you know, loop. Yeah. yeah. And before bedtime is the most important time for self-care for that reason, I found. Absolutely. Yeah. A, rout- a bedtime routine is really important. Yeah. Um, and of course, a lot of wildlife carers don't necessarily have that bedtime routine because they know they're going to be getting up in four hours to feed a kangaroo or several. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and ble- get, bless them for bless them. Yeah. Yes. Let's get back to the to the carers for a moment. Um, of course. Because I'm just thinking about what it is that they'd be going through right now. Right now. Right now. Uh, lots of lo- lots of grief and loss. Um, lots of existential angst, um, for want of a better phrase, really, of you know what does the future look like? Um, lots of helplessness and hopelessness. Um, there's, you know, a lot of them are in survival mode. They're just running, just running around, um, Mm -hmm. you know, going into fire grounds, picking up animals. Um, a lot of the animals that they're finding, um, they're either, they're they're having to have euthanized because they're too badly injured. Um, so that comes back to the grief and loss again. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, there's an awful lot of stuff going on right now. They're not thinking about financial pressures right now. They're not thinking of. Yep, they're not thinking about the the, um, the 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 internal politics and fighting that go on in organisations, uh, which happens a lot in normal day to day stuff. 
Um, when I did my research in 2018, I found that the biggest issue in wildlife caring was actually bullying. Um, mm. And there's a whole there's a whole story around that because I've sort of over the last 12 months have been thinking, well, where's this coming from? And what I've actually realised is is that because they're not dealing with their their grief and loss and they're not dealing with their hopelessness and people who have been doing this for a long time and I'm talking generalizations here I'm not talking yeah. specifics um what I and I'm, I'm hypothesizing as to why this happens but basically what I'm what I'm seeing is that people who are um experiencing bullying are experiencing experiencing it from people who have been doing the work for a long time they haven't dealt with the people who, who are who are doing the bullying, for want of a better phrase, aren't necessarily um, dealing with everything that they're dealing with. So they're not dealing with the grief and loss. They're not dealing with it. They have a particular way of doing things because they've been doing it for a long way time and it works for them. A new person comes in and goes, hey, I've got a great new idea. <laughs> Let's do it this way. No, and this person <laughs> is basically like, no, 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 no. Don't tell me how to do things. I've been doing this for a long time. But the reason why they get so defensive about that thing that they've been doing and they want to hold on to it so hard is because any kind of opening up is going to release some of that stuff that they haven't dealt with. Yeah. So therefore it gets, it, it reveals itself as anger and it reveals itself as some, some quite sort of antisocial and quite unpleasant behaviors. So, you know, in, in some ways, these people need to deal, they need to deal with their stuff. <laughs> Everybody needs to deal with their stuff. I'm a therapist. We all need to deal with our stuff. We need to deal with it. <laughs> we, all, we all need to deal with it. Whatever that, whatever that stuff is, we need to deal with it. But they also need people who, are, people who are receiving it and seeing it and witnessing it actually also need to have some compassion for those people as well. Yeah. That the, 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 the reason why this behavior is happening is because they are, they're holding it together. Yeah. And they're not necessarily doing it in a great way, but they're, they're holding it together. Yeah. And obviously some people handle, handle those sorts of stress, stresses much better than others. So, yeah, absolutely. It's a, there, there's, there's an awful lot going on. There's an awful lot going on. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Um, but yes, mental health definitely is, is a, and I can say this cause I've been a wildlife carer. Uh, you kind of got to be a little bit crazy to be a wildlife carer in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a special yeah. breed of people. Yeah. yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. 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 So my, and my thinking at the moment is, okay, that a lot of them be going through that grief of losing the animals that they have been caring for, that they've sent out into the wild. But I'm Yeah, also, absolutely. Yeah. But I, I'm thinking with, with my own experience of, of grief that sometimes you just, that they're probably going, a lot of the... They're just into this is what we have to do mode and just going about doing yeah. it. And then yeah. down the track, a few months, might be a few months, might be several months down the track, that's when they're going to crack. Yeah, absolutely. So a few years ago, we had some pretty devastating bushfires in the Canberra region. We had, mm -hmm. um, we had uh, one up at Mount Ferry that burnt through about 35,000 hectares. And then we had another one in Kalwoolwa which burnt through about 25, I think it was. Um, they were both um, started through human error. Um, it weren't lightning strikes. Um, and we, ha we saw a lot of wildlife. Um, I, I remember going out and feeding, and, you know, doing hay drops and carrot drops and things like that, the wildlife in those areas. And when, I, when, when we were going onto people's properties, um, the first property we went onto, I, we, you know, I got out of the car and I said, you know, hi, my name's Francis. I'm from this organisation. I'm here to do the, you know, you've agreed to have some food placed on your property for the animals. And this woman came out and she was just ashen. And she was just, and, I was, and she was like, <laughs> and she was just basically kind of not in a space. And I said, you know, are you okay? And she was like, I'm, I'm, I'm really not dealing with this very well. This is the first time I've been out of the house in three days because I can't bear to see the blackness. So her, her house was in the middle of, blackness so they had managed to save her house yeah. but everything else was gone and she just couldn't bear to look at it so i basically extended my offer that i offered to, to wildlife carers to the people that i came across who had been impacted directly by the bushfires um and 
it wasn't then that she came and saw me. She came and saw me and many of her friends came and saw me three, four, five months after. So the regeneration yes. started. Absolutely. Things had started getting back to normal. That was when they, she started, they, 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 all, they all started having similar, they all started experiencing traumatic symptoms, post-traumatic yeah. symptoms. Um, as a therapist, I don't diagnose, so I can't say that they had PTSD, but they certainly had quite a lot of these symptoms of um, and the indicators of PTSD. And we worked through that. You know, we worked, we worked through it with them. So we got them back into that, that stage. And that's what's happening. That's what happens with wildlife carers. Yeah. Right now, survival mode. If they're calling, it's because they're so distraught. So every, nearly every single person I've spoken to has basically been just verbal vomiting down the phone at me in complete distress and don't know what to do and complete overwhelm. So it's bringing them back to right here, right now. And sort of centering them back into centering them and getting them back to focus. That's what I've been doing now. Yeah. In three or four months' time is when I'm going to start seeing those people coming through because the fire danger has passed, the weather has cooled, the rain will have come through, you know. And now and then we're going to start seeing. Well, there's no habitat for these animals. Yeah. What do we do? What do we do? So it is going to be, it's, it, this is an ongoing thing. And um, yeah. you know, two, two years ago, well before the fires, I identified that we needed to help wildlife carers with, their, with, with this. And that's why I planned on, you know, doing this. And so it's an ongoing thing. This is not, this is not a, just a response to the fires. No. This, is a, this is a response to an ongoing long-term requirement for wildlife carers because, you know, I've spoken to many people who aren't involved in wildlife and they've been going on about, you know, oh, look at the koalas, look at the koalas, they're all burnt in their hands and they're so cute. And I said, yeah, but what about the carers? And they're like, oh, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about the carers. I'm like, yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're, I know. they're forgotten. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah, nobody ever thinks. And they're volunteers. They're, you know, they're, they're just like the RFS, they're volunteers. Mm. They're not paid for this. You know, they, they might get a little bit of a handout from the organisation um, that, you know, for, for food. But most of them are stumping up their own, their own cash. Wildlife yeah. carers buy property specifically so that they can release animals on it safely. You know, these people are 100% dedicated to what they do. Yeah. And they don't, they don't generally ask for help. And they, they really struggle putting their hand out for help. You know, and, you know, I've noticed that, you know, we've got, you know, everybody, everyone would have heard, everyone in Australia has heard of WISE. Everybody's heard of WISE. Yes. WISE has um, a paid staff. They have a marketing department. They have a CEO. But about 95% of their people are volunteers in different, yeah. organi in different branches across the country. Absolutely. WISE don't operate in all areas of australia no so all the money that people are donating to wires as a result of this this fire is going to be most of it's going to be staying in new south wales and it's most of it's going to be going to the office yeah it's Sorry. not going it's not going to the people who aren't connected to wires yeah. so for instance you to you know, your local area of who you want to support Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I see it every day. Um, you know, um, in Canberra, we don't have wires in the Canberra region. We have ACT Wildlife and we have Wildcare Queanbeyan, which operates in the New South Wales border region. So they, they, we've also been affected and, and NARG, which is Native Animal Wildlife Group. So a rescue group. So they're based down in the fire fields, Bateman Bay. NARG is Batemans Bay area. They are not going to see any of the money that's raised by wires. Yeah. Wildlife Queenbean are not going to see any of that money. So these people are all getting the animals from the South Coast, as are ACT Wildlife, because they're, they're all coming together to help each other. But what happens is, is that because the public hear the word wires, 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 when something happens, everyone goes, oh, you should call wires. So there's this real disenfranchisement as well from for wildlife carers of 
we're not wires. We yeah. need help as well. Yeah. Help us. No, so we're not, your local people. Yeah. We're your locals. It's not we helping no those, those no. in Queensland or on Kangaroo Island at all. So you've no, it's not. And the thing, and the and the thing with that disenfranchisement, that you know, disenfranchisement comes from the fact that you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Nobody knows what I'm doing. Everyone thinks I'm. Everyone thinks it's just these people. So, but they've got a really good marketing budget, and they've got a really good marketing budget now. <laughs> a really good marketing budget now. But these three little organisations that have been helping all the wildlife from the south coast fires in Batemans Bay and Cabago and places like that, you know, that have had devastating losses, aren't getting a look in. Mm-hmm. even from their local radio stations. The local radio station is advertising, if you want to donate to the wildlife, donate to WISE. No, don't donate to WISE, donate to these people. So yeah. as, you can, as you can imagine, that's actually also something that really, really causes a lot of distress to the wildlife carers because it's like, no, we need this money to go to our animals and our medical supplies and our feed and, our, and everything that we need but it's all going to Sydney. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's, a, there's, there's a quite a lot of, there's, as you can tell, I'm extremely passionate on behalf of the wildlife carers. <laughs> yeah. And that's important because yeah. what, what hits you for your passion, somebody. So I think that we all just have, we just need this one thing each. If we have one thing each, yeah. we'll just fight, fight and fight, fight for it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been all consuming for me for the last sort of, the last sort of, six weeks um yeah. uh, i went back to work in my private practice uh, a couple of weeks ago and you know i had all my sex therapy clients coming in which is actually a little bit of a light relief and <laughs> well, um but yes yeah 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 it will compare compared <laughs> to people howling down the phone at me absolutely um not that i'm complaining that they do that they need somebody to do that too but it's yeah it was it's a real it, there's a real sort of like switch that i have to do in my head to get out of wildlife mode and into this other you know mm, yes absolutely yes that's very difficult yes <laughs> yes so just, <laughs> just as a kind of a, a sideline because this is what often what I talk about on, yeah. on the podcast is how do you find having a business and a social mission that that Kind of, they have the similarities in some ways, but they're quite different. So, how do you find that having that social mission helps you with your business? How does um, it? Work? I actually don't think it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, just how I do you balance it too? Oh, re- it's really hard. It's one of the reasons why I have to force myself to do things like drive all the way up to Sydney to go to the movies. Um, Having having a social mission, especially a social mission that that quite a large proportion of the population just don't get, um, is a little bit thankless at times. Um, even my own even my own family don't get it. Uh, most of my, <laughs> oh, that's fa- quite even my yeah yeah well most of my family are in the UK so they kind of like yeah you know let's just yeah, kill all the budgets. Um, they, don't, <laughs> they don't. Wildlife is not something that they really even give consideration to unless it's a cute a cute um hedgehog eating the snails in the garden to from the animals you know from the veggies but um yeah they just they a lot of people just don't get it so what i've what i've found what i'm finding really difficult is raising funds because i can't afford to keep doing this myself i can't keep doing this free (laughs) no um as a as a single woman who lives on her own who just does you know does everything on her own um, I can't keep funding this. I've been funding this myself for the last five years. Uh, it has cost me um, a lot financially. Um, and so I'm, try- I'm trying to raise funds. And, you know, yeah. I put a GoFundMe out there and um, I've got just over $2,000. And it's kind of like, oh. And then I look at other people who, who don't even have a purpose for their GoFundMe. It's and they're just a... Yeah. Thousands. And they've got... And they've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And yes. it's like insane. Oh my God. You don't even have, you, it's just, we're just raising money for the fires. What? What? <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> Where are they, that money actually going to go? Is, <laughs> is, when I see that, I kind of, 
I get the skepticism coming up as well. It's like, where exactly yeah. is that money going? Yeah. yeah. So there's been, for, for me, there's been a level of frustration around that, yes. especially when my friends share those pages to me. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Ah, <laughs> help. Ah, help. <laughs> help me, please help, please help me. Um, and you know, that $2,000 that I've raised um, has nearly all gone already in calls. Yeah. So you know, I need, I need, I need that. I need that help. Uh, yeah. I need that help there. So that's why I say that my social mission doesn't necessarily, it's very passionate for me. It's very meaningful to a lot of people, but then, you know, I'm also finding that people just generally, you know, maybe it's because it's free. I don't know. I, I find that, I find that when people are offered something for free, they don't seem to give it the same value that, that it would have if they had to pay for it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it's really strange. Like it's it's really strange because I I I I've all, I've always had a, I've always had side hustles. I've I've always been a little bit of a you know bit of a um, I've enjoyed doing stuff and doing markets and things like that. And I'm a crocheter, and I'll crochet a scarf and a scar and I'll make it out of cashmere and merino. And it will take me sixteen hours to make. And so I work it out at like eighteen dollars an hour plus the materials. So this scarf, which is a completely one-off, unique item, which will never be repeated and hasn't been made from a pattern, is $585. Mm -hmm. Example. Yeah. And people will go, that's really expensive. And I'll go, it's $18 an hour. How much do you earn an hour? It's more than that, especially if you're in the public service, which most people in Canberra are. Yeah. And they're like, and I go, okay, well, how much would you be willing to spend to pay for that scarf if you bought it in, uh, you know, a high street store where there's hundreds of those made by people behind the scenes that you'll never know. And I know that they'd probably pay $120 for that scarf, mm -hmm. but there's every likelihood that they would run into somebody wearing that same scarf at a party. Which is not acceptable. <laughs> No, exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. I've, I've, I've run into people wearing the same outfit as me and I'm kind of like, yeah, whatever. Anyway, but, but the point is that there's, there's, this, there's, this, there's this disconnect between what it costs to do something and when you love doing it. Yes. Because you have lovingly created this thing and you do this thing because you are passionate about it, does that make it less valuable to people? And that's what I really struggle with when I see people selling handmade beanies for $8. Yeah. It's like you are completely undervaluing your love of doing it. But I won't be able to say they're not getting anything more on it. Or are they? Well, they're barely covering the cost of the materials. Yeah. I doubt. I doubt they're even covering the cost of materials. But it's like, oh, but I wouldn't be able to sell it if I, if I put more on it. I go, just give it a go. Yeah. Just give it a go. But they're not even willing to give it a go because people are so used to not getting things for free, but it actually actually devalued a lot of what we do. Yeah. So yeah. even even, you know, even, you know, a free counselling service, well, why is it free? Does that mean that the person who's doing it isn't any good? Yeah. It's like, well, actually no. <laughs> You know, but why do we have to pay for it if it's free? Who's paying for it? Well, I, I am. Oh, okay then. <laughs> you can donate. You can donate. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. So it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting thing. So from a social mission point of view, that's the bit that I struggle with. Yes. I have absolutely no issue with providing the services and doing the work and, you know, helping people as much as I possibly can. I really struggle with this concept of because I'm willing to do it for free, everybody's willing to just accept that rather than going, but you shouldn't be doing it for free. Yeah. Yes. Well, hopefully we'll have some people listen to this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you, you be touched by what you're doing and be able to donate so. your, to your GoFundMe account or yeah. yeah. Well, I hope to have a bank Some account way. next week. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that will um, help. If people, if people are listening and they know wildlife, uh, wildlife people, and they think that they, they may benefit from this, um, they can access 
wildtalk.com.au. Mm-hmm. Um, and the right at the top of the page is the telephone number, which is one three hundred three zero seven triple one. Yep. And there's a little bit about it's a bit it's a bit bare bones at the moment because again eight months in advance. Um, and then right at the bottom of that page is the GoFundMe page, which will stay there. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Just because you know these things take time and they take a little bit of this, they take a little bit of money. Yeah. You know the stuff that folds. So a little bit of money. You know. Would go a long yeah. way way in helping you to help other people who Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean support, you know. And I've and, and I and I've partnered up with an amazing employee assistance program who are based in Australia. They are based in Queensland. They are a family run a family run business. They have an amazing network of about fifteen hundred um counsellors across Australia who will be people who are interested in helping with this will actually be, I will be teaching them about some of the little things of, you know, wildlife specifics, you know, they, they, you know, they're drug and alcohol specialists and things like that. They're also going to become wildlife specialists, wildlife care specialists. Yeah. Um, And, you know, they're, they're, they're they're not doing their usual, you know, if they pay me a hundred dollars an hour, they're not going to be charging the client a hundred dollars an hour. They're just going to be adding a little bit just to cover the costs of, dealing with the phone line and the, 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 um, the channeling of the calls. So they're not making any money out of this either. Yeah. So it's, it's, an, but we're, but we're hopefully being able to, we're going to be paying the therapists because they've got mortgages and, and bills yeah. to pay just like everybody else. They need some, we can't, ex- we can't, I, I can't expect anybody else to do this for free, but I know that I can't keep doing it for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we need to be able to respect people for their time and their expertise. The time yeah. they just, and recognizing the time that they take out in doing this is time they're taking away from from being paid work, which keeps them going. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, i i want to I want to be able to pay the therapists that provide this service because it is going to be a specialist a specialist field. I. I've been asked by many people, why do wildlife carers need this, you know, need their own, you know, their own specialist people? And it's like, well, if you've got a drug and alcohol issue, you go to a drug and alcohol counsellor. If you've got an anger issue, you go to somebody who specialises in dealing with anger, you know, so because they've got their own little eccentricities that you have to deal with. Wildlife care is no exception to that. Yeah, people have to understand. The, care, the therapists have to understand what they're going through and what their experiences are about. Well, well, yeah, because if a, if a carer comes if a carer comes to you and says, "Oh, I've just been to a mass extinction event," you don't want your counsellor to go, "Well, what does that mean?" And then you have to explain to them the trauma that you've just witnessed. Yes. You need your counsellor to understand that this is going to mean possibly one of a few different things. Yep. You need your own, you don't want to have to explain that. If you're already traumatized, you don't want to have to explain it again. It's not helpful. No. So yeah. It's a yeah, I'm very I'm very, very, very passionate. <laughs> what can I, I say? Can and that's that's great. And that's what we appreciate about on this show. I love that's it's all about passionate people doing something good for the world. Yeah. Thank you. And so I'd really like to thank you for for your time today, Francis. It's been wonderful talking to you and learning a bit more about wildlife carers and what they're going through and I really hope that some people out there can all think about assisting you in some way and we've already yeah. mentioned what your website is but it's web wildtalk.com.au so yes yes yeah. if they'd like to drop by there and hit onto the GoFundMe campaign I'm sure you'll greatly appreciate it yeah they can contact they can contact me through that as well yeah Yeah. okay so thank you so much thank you for caring (laughs) thank you and that's all for today on the social mission revolution and we'll be back in the next episode with another social mission revolutionist This has been the Social Mission Revolution with Andrea Putting. Join me again next week when we'll speak to another Social Mission Revolutionist. 
who will inspire you on your journey to making your ultimate impact on the world.